Back in 1990, General Motors revealed a concept for its first car designed from the ground up as an electric car. Despite its somewhat inappropriate name for a car, the Impact, positive public response resulted in a production car with a new name, the EV1, in 1996. Available only for lease in a small number of markets through Saturn dealerships, the EV1 quickly became a huge liability for GM when it became clear that it would never make them a profit, and even worse, brought on new zero-emission regulations in California when the state saw the potential for the original concept's success, leading to GM taking back and crushing nearly every EV1 by 2003. Ironically, this decision would be the catalyst for a decision that GM likely never imagined. This is the story of the GM EV1. This is my old car. The electric car is here. GM's EV1, the car of the future today. If you are a regular viewer of my channel, you know that I always end each episode asking for suggestions of cars you rarely see on the road today. Out of all the cars I have featured, the EV1 is the first and probably only car which I can say with 100% certainty that you haven't seen on the road recently. And the vast majority of you probably have never seen one in person, except for maybe in a museum. Yes, there have been a few abandoned models found, and a few others hidden away. So why did GM spend nearly a billion dollars on a car that they ultimately wanted to be erased from existence? Well, keep watching to find out. Before I continue, a big thank you to fellow YouTuber Hillary, who has a copy of an original EV1 press release binder from GM. Written back in 1996, it offers several photos and specs about the EV1. I'll provide a link in the description below, where she created a video going through all the pages, so you can read it yourself. The tone of the writing in this press release clearly tried to imply how proud General Motors was for developing this technological marvel, and yet behind the scenes, they were actually working towards its ultimate failure. Although the EV1 is likely the most famous of GM's attempts to produce an electric car, it was definitely not the first. General Motors was one of several automakers in the 1910s that attempted to produce electric vehicles during a time when their low range and power wasn't a liability due to the lack of modern roads and highways. But as roads improved and gasoline refinement technology improved, electric cars were soon pushed out of the market. GM did make another attempt in 1964 with the Electrovair, a Chevy Corvair concept with its rear-mounted internal combustion engine replaced with an electric motor and the former front trunk filled with silver zinc batteries. Two years later, GM would try the same in a full-size van and in a second-generation Corvair called the Electrovair II. Even a Chevy Chevette was converted to electric power as a concept in 1977. In 1987, GM won the World Solar Challenge in Australia with a solar-powered car called the Sun Racer. The learnings from this experiment led the CEO of General Motors, Roger Smith, to collaborate with a defense contractor and electric vehicle company called Aerovironment to develop a new concept that was called the Impact. And yes, that was the actual name of the concept car, which is amazing that no one of influence back then saw the words impact and car in the same sentence and think maybe that wasn't the best choice. Yet this photo makes it clear that they were quite proud of it. Although considering this particular impact achieved a land speed record of 183 miles per hour, the name became something to be proud of instead. By the early 90s, new car designs were moving toward more aerodynamic shapes, not just because they were more fuel efficient, but I suspect also because car design had gotten so square in the 80s that they had no other direction to go. But the impact show car pushed the whole aerodynamic look to its furthest extreme for the sake of extended range. The trade-off was a car that could only hold two passengers, but it was also an experiment with its extensive use of aluminum to help save weight, especially when you consider that although the EV1 weighed just under 3,000 pounds, nearly 40% of that weight was from the 32 lead-acid batteries that were positioned between and behind the car's occupants. Later models would be available with nickel-metal hydride batteries, but that only dropped the overall weight of the car by less than 100 pounds. The Impact concept also introduced features that were new for any car at the time, but standard equipment for electric cars today, such as regenerative braking. This is the process by which the electric motor plays an active role in decelerating the car and transferring the energy used in deceleration to recharge the batteries. The driver could press a button on the gear selector, which was then known as the coast down mode, to slow the car when the driver lifted their foot off the accelerator, or they could choose a free wheeling mode, which allowed the car to coast down hills without using any battery. The Impact, and later the EV1, also had keyless entry. I thought you started, and there was no key. Is that pushing the buttons? Look up there. 
fact, it didn't even come with a key. Instead, the driver entered a code on a keypad outside the door, and then entered the same code inside, next to the gear lever, to electronically start the car. A radical idea for the 90s. However, the feature GM tried to play up the most was the instant torque, which allowed 0 to 60 times of under 9 seconds. That doesn't sound all that fast today, but to be honest, I don't think that would have been considered seriously fast in the 1990s either. I suspect a near silent acceleration made the experience seem better than it really was. Yet if anyone actually wanted to test this, they did it at the risk of losing a considerable amount of range, something the car simply couldn't afford to lose. The general expectation was that it could go up to 80 miles on a single charge, but after just a couple quick launches to test the 0 to 60 time, the battery could lose half of its charge. By 1994, after 50 of the impact models were hand built, GM started a new test program called Preview, and yes of course the letters EV were capitalized, a marketing trend that is often still in use today. When the test was announced via an 800 number that volunteers could call to sign up, they were overwhelmed with over 10,000 calls, forcing the phone line to be shut down far earlier than originally planned. The calls came in from all over the country, despite the fact that the two-week test would be done in the Los Angeles area. The takeaway from the test proved to be favorable overall, which in hindsight shouldn't have been surprising, considering that most, if not all, of the volunteers were early adopters who wanted to learn about the new technology, and therefore were more willing to live with its compromises. GM offered the testers their own home-based charging stations, which could recharge batteries in three hours. But if they needed a charge with a standard three-prong outlet, the charge time could extend to 14 hours. Even automotive magazines of the time were generally impressed and gave it good reviews. In fact, the overall public reception went far beyond what the top execs at General Motors had expected or more importantly, hoped would happen. It was shocking news last year when General Motors became the first modern automaker to sell an all-electric vehicle. GM had originally started the impact concept to be better prepared for the inevitable stricter environmental regulations that would be coming out of California, which at the time not only had the worst air quality in the nation, but was worse than the other 49 states combined. GM's original commitment with the impact concept at its launch in 1990 was as high as 100,000 per year. But that was due to the enormous cost of the project, and that production number was necessary to make a profit. Considering the EV1 only had two seats, that alone should have made the idea of 100,000 buyers extremely unlikely. I didn't think you guys would just jump on this electric car thing and work it this hard. I mean, I thought maybe... Oh, you thought we sort of just sat around like Nobel laureates, stroked our beards and said... By the end of the preview test, that commitment by GM dropped to as low as an initial run of 5,000 cars as the soaring costs made it clear they would never make a profit. In other words, they simply wanted it to be left as a learning experience and move on to building more efficient gasoline or hybrid cars that may still turn a profit. A breakthrough in batteries will just make a car like this that much better. I mean, maybe we will see a 300 mile range in the future. Yet that commitment of an initial 5,000 unit run was enough for the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, to move forward with an initiative that shocked all the automakers that sold cars in the United States. People have a concept of electric vehicles that they're essentially golf carts and they're not going to be viable. What GM proved with the impact is that if you go about it right, it could be made a viable product. The requirement was all the automakers, the largest being GM, have 2% of their fleet be emission-free by 1998, 5% by 2001, and 10% by 2003. If they couldn't meet this goal, they would not be allowed to sell any vehicles in California. Although privately, GM considered the preview test to be a failure, at least in regards to long-term viability. The CARB rules required that the project move forward. Although the original 50 test cars were later crushed, GM released its first generation EV1 in 1996 for the 1997 model year, with just 660 cars built for that year. The EV1 would be the first, and so far the only car ever branded as GM, and as such, it had no dealer network. So instead, GM chose to sell the EV1 through its Saturn dealer network. Saturn? No way. Saturn was, at the time, the most unconventional division GM had, and as such, Saturn's core audience was probably the best fit for an experimental car. The press materials Hillary provided for me say that they chose Saturn to distribute and service the EV1 because of Saturn's unique brand marketing and focus on customer satisfaction. Which leads to the next question, why didn't they just brand it as a Saturn? That's a Saturn? Yeah. And making this claim about Saturn indirectly implies that the other GM divisions did not focus on customer satisfaction, or at least didn't do it as well as Saturn. Speaking of the other GM divisions, they were not happy about this, as most of the other dealer network had been in business for far longer than Saturn, which had only just launched in 1990, and would miss out on the increased exposure the EV1 could give to their dealerships, even if they couldn't lease very many EV1s. 
You may have noticed that I said lease, not buy. This goes along with GM continuing to treat the EV1 like a short-term experiment, hence the decision to not allow anyone to purchase an EV1 to own, but instead they only allow leases, which were required to be returned at the end of the lease. They also were only available in California and Arizona, although for a short time the lease plan was extended to Atlanta as well. The inside temperature must be a million degrees. I could kill my air conditioning, but I have about 20 miles left. With lease prices that topped out at $549 a month, the equivalent of over $1,000 a month today. The EV1 was typically only sold to higher income consumers, further limiting its potential sales targets. Each car was built in the Lansing Craft Center in Lansing, Michigan, a former Oldsmobile plant first built in 1919 and was repurposed in the 1980s to become the Riata Craft Center to build the Buick Riata from 1988 to 1991. Following the cancellation of the Riata, the same facility was repurposed for converting Chevy Cavalier and Pontiac Sunfire coupes into convertibles between 1995 and 2000, alongside the EV1. The original analysis for the EV1 production was expected to be from 5,000 to 20,000 built per year, with a lead-acid battery pack, known as Generation 1, and an additional 457 with nickel metal hydride batteries, which was Generation 2, which was released in December of 1999. Over the following two years, 200 of the Gen 1 models were recalled to have the newer batteries retrofitted. Although leases of the Gen 2 models continued through 2001, GM had long since shut down the assembly line at the Lansing Craft Center, as the 457 Gen 2 models had been built prior to the end of 1999. Long waiting lists remained for the EV1, despite production being shut down. In fact, despite GM having no intention of restarting production, the waiting list continued to grow. Many of the lessees continued to pressure GM to allow them to buy out their lease, but GM wouldn't budge insisting that every model be returned at the end of their lease. Although GM had earlier promised that every lease would be allowed to continue until its designated end, that all changed on February 7, 2002, when all current lessees were notified that they were required to return their EV1s, regardless of the original lease end date. Not surprisingly, this turned into a PR nightmare for GM. And we are not going to just stand here. We're going to keep demanding that they build these cars again. Anybody else feel that way? Yeah. And it got even worse once the public learned what would happen to the EV1's return. Most of them ended up being crushed, although a few were officially donated for museums or research facilities, but with their propulsion systems deactivated to prevent them from ever getting back on the road. Former lessees were horrified and angry at the decision, but it all came down to liability, as GM didn't want to incur the continued cost of maintenance, not to mention any potential safety recalls. They already had endured one recall on the Gen 1 models due to a risk of the lead-acid batteries catching fire. Some might say that to be here gathered today to mourn the loss of a car would be going too far. But of course, as expected, a few people managed to hide their EV1s and never turn them in, resulting in some of them, of course, showing up in YouTube videos. I really loved this car, and when I heard they were going to destroy them all, I hid it. <laughs> so that they couldn't get it. In the end, GM's official position on the reason for canceling the EV1 was that there wasn't enough consumer demand to make it a viable product. Yet the long waiting list seemed to contradict this opinion. We have a little term for driving an EV1. It's called rocket ride. Believe it or not, that sucker goes. That really? thing will take you down the PCH so fast you can get a ticket. I did kind of feel like Batman, you know, that sort of like, Wee! who killed the electric car? And for God's sake, why? Electric cars were only necessary to satisfy the carb requirement, and when they couldn't meet it, GM and other automakers pushed to get the deadlines extended until the battery technology could allow for reasonable range and recharging times. But of course, GM never wanted to meet those goals, as it would mean selling a money-losing car instead of the far more profitable gas-powered car. It will go down as one of the biggest blunders in the history of the automotive industry. But although the scrapping of the EV1 may have been in GM's best interest at the time, Elon Musk has said that the cancellation of the EV1 led him to Tesla, which today is the largest all-electric vehicle company in the world, and the company that nearly every other automaker is using as their benchmark to beat, including General Motors. The Volt head has overtaken the petrol head. And yes, yes, I've just heard, it is snowing in hell. It's only been in the last few years that GM has made a significant investment in electric cars with their new Ultium platform that is expected to underpin at least 25 different models by the end of the decade. Hey, Norway, listen up, you fish-loving! Oh, this place is adorable. When you see a GMC Hummer EV on the road, it's a bit hard to believe the same company once made the comparatively tiny EV1. Damn it! Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. 
If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Thank you.